Okay, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our event, Prevent and the Pre-Crime State. Um, I'm Sarah and I'm Open Rights Group's Programme Manager for Pre-Crime and I'm going to be chairing today's conversation. And before we get started, just to give you a bit of an overview of how today's session will run, um, I'll first be giving a bit of an introduction to Open Rights Group, who we are and what we do. I'm then going to be introducing you to our new report called Prevent and the Pre-Crime State and sharing some of our key findings and some key recommendations. We're then going to be joined by three brilliant speakers who are experts on Prevent and who are going to be speaking a bit more about some of the key themes that come up in the report and also their work as it relates to this issue. And then finally, there's going to be some time for questions at the end. Um, so just on the point of questions, please feel free to ask questions throughout the call. Um, and you can do that using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, it would be great if you could use this icon rather than the chat box, just because we're not going to be monitoring the chat box to see um, the questions. Um, it would also be great if you could say which panelist the question is for. Um, and also just to bear in mind that we will be recording today's conversation. Okay. So to introduce Open Rights Group. So Open Rights Group is the UK's largest grassroots digital rights campaigning organization working to protect the right to privacy and free speech online. We fight for a fair digital environment where technology supports justice, equality and freedom and we do this by campaigning, lobbying, going to court, really whatever it takes to challenge restrictions to our human rights. It's important to note that we're committed to challenging the ways in which digital harms can create and reinforce inequalities in society. And this is particularly relevant where today we're going to be talking about prevent, which disproportionately impacts Muslims, neurodiverse people and children. So with the support of Charlotte Heath Kelly and Prevent Watch, who we'll be introducing you to later, um, in February, we released a new report called Prevent in the Pre-Crime State, how unaccountable data sharing is harming a generation. So what was really novel about this report is that for the first time, we were able to shine a light on what happens to people's data once a prevent referral has been made. Um, and we did this by tracking the journey of data once it enters the system. What we found is that data is being widely shared and retained for years, even when referrals are marked no, far, no further action. So for context, we previously had anecdotal evidence that people were being stopped at ports and airports under Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act. Um, and what this does is that it authorizes authorities to stop, question, and even detain and search um, individuals. But through our research, we're now able to prove that the data of prevent referees is being retained and shared across multiple databases. And as you can imagine, this is having potentially harmful outcomes. So what were our key findings? We found that referrals are stored within a national prevent database, regardless of whether they meet the threshold to be reviewed by a channel panel. So for context, the channel panel is a multi-agency panel of professionals, which includes police and local authorities. And what they do is they assess whether a person should be invo invited to join um, the channel de-radicalization program. Um, the key issue with this is that because it's blanket storage of data, this more or less equates to mass surveillance. And as you can imagine, this can have a really lasting impact on people's lives. We also found that data is being held for a minimum of six years, but can be kept for up to 100 years. So such excessive data retention periods are completely unnecessary, but also disproportionate to the standards required under the UK data protection regulations. And then we also found that there are particular harms for children who make up the majority of referrals. So. I feel like um, in the report, there are case studies of children who've been harmed by PREVENT. Um, and um, this includes, for example, a 16 year old who had a sixth form place withdrawn following a PREVENT referral. And this is just one of many examples which really highlights how children are being particularly harmed by PREVENT referrals. So we also found that there appeared to be a lack of oversight and parliamentary scrutiny over data sharing, processing and storage of prevent referrals that are deemed inappropriate for channel interventions, 
but which are managed by the police-led partnerships. So the police-led partnerships is a covert space where national security exemptions can be applied. And there seems to be a lack of oversight to how this is managed in particular. We also found that the data of some prevent referees is being shared with airports, ports and immigration services. So we touched on this a bit earlier, but what's really important here is that prevent referees can be impacted in any facet of their lives where they have contact with authorities. And finally, it's really difficult for individuals to exercise their right to erasure and, requ and request that their data is removed. So a lot of individuals don't know that they have been referred to prevent in the first place, which makes access to redress really, really difficult. So before I go on to outlining our recommendations, something I would say is that our report has become even more relevant because we know that there's been an increase in referrals since October the 7th. So for context, the Met's Assistant Police Commissioner, Matt Jakes, told journalists that prevent referrals had increased 13% between October the 7th and December the 31st, compared with the same period the previous year. Um, Org tried to find out more about these referrals and where they were being made from, um, but this was rejected, which I think really highlights the lack of transparency with prevent and its operation. So taken together, when it comes to our key recommendations, um, we're recommending that the government impose an immediate moratorium on prevent referrals. We're recommending that they introduce a blanket ban on the retention of data where thresholds under sections 36 of the Counterterrorism and Security Act are not met. And ultimately we're calling that they end the prevent duty altogether. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview of our report and our key findings. Um, and we can make sure we get this emailed out to you after the call as well. But now I am really pleased to be able to introduce you to our first speaker, um, Ilias Nagdi. So Ilias's work at Amnesty focuses on civil liberties, policing, counterterrorism, securitization, and movement building relating to racial justice. He has been published in both academic and non-academic publications on racism, religious discrimination, decolonization, and civil liberties. So um, over to you, Ilias. Good morning, everyone. Uh... I'd like to thank by, thank, uh, by thanking Sara and Open Rights Group for hosting uh, and organizing uh, this webinar today. Um, uh, I'm really grateful to be here alongside so many fantastic speakers. Um, and I'll be talking uh, uh, about the Amnesty International UK report into the prevent duty that was released at the end of last year. Uh, sorry, I should have said my name's Ilias. I'm the racial justice uh, program lead at Amnesty International UK. Um, so last November, Amnesty International UK released a report into the government's prevent duty and its impact on human rights. Many of our findings uh, are similar to those that were found by Open Rights Group, uh, who have done a fantastic job uh, highlighting specifically those digital harms that are quite often underexplored. Um, uh, and uh, it, indeed, it wasn't a key part of our investigation, but it's fantastic that so many organizations are working on different elements of this and highlighting uh, the concerns uh, raised about PREVENT, which have been raised for several years. Uh, Amnesty International has been alert to the criticisms and concerns raised about PREVENT for several years. Two years ago, uh, we began investigating the impact of PREVENT on freedom of expression, association and assembly, and the right to non-discrimination. So there were many conclusions that were reached in the on these areas amongst other areas including finding violations to the right to redress and remedy as Sarah spoke to the right to religion belief and conscience uh, and the right to privacy and family life so when we when uh, when we spoke to individuals that had been impacted by prevent referrals they and it's really hard to summarize the impact um, on individuals and their families that a prevent referral has. But just briefly summarizing some of the things that uh, people spoke about, it includes things like a loss of trust in state institutions, including for those who are vulnerable, sometimes the institutions that are required to support them. One of the case studies in the Amnesty report um, of uh, Connor is someone that requires daily social work support and uh, began to lose trust in in, in, in the staff that were necessary to support his uh, assisted living. 
other stresses include uh, developing anxiety, there's horrendous mental health consequences, unmanageable financial costs. Those are quite often associated with attempting to get redress and remedy. Again, just as was spoken to, the fact that people don't know if they whether or not they've been referred to prevent and where information has been held, who has access to it, all of those things means that in some cases, for example, with uh, the father of Connor who approached multiple law firms uh, saying that he would fund a private, private case um, to find out what's happened with his son's information, many law firms Funds were just did not have the expertise to take this up, and that's quite often a challenge for many people, um, and that's a barrier to redress and remedy. Uh, there are very there's very little information uh, out there on how people can challenge prevent referral. Uh, there's no real route. Many of the case studies that we spoke to said is that it's like a maze. There's no way out. Um, people who had been referred in 2020. Their parents are still attempting to find out the reason for their referral many years later. And the poor transparency surrounding prevent compounds these effects. So efforts by institutions and individuals to comply with prevent, those that are required to do so by the Counterterrorism and Security Act, are leading to violations of people's rights to freedom of expression, thought, conscience, religion, peaceful assembly, and critically, the right to equality and non-discrimination. As a result, similar to ORG, Amnesty International concluded that the violations documented in, in our research led to the stark conclusion that the UK must scrap the prevent strategy in order to comply with its international human rights obligations. I'll briefly summarise some of the human rights impacts um, that we found. So on discrimination, uh, the prevent strategy defines certain indicators as of radicalisation, uh, behaviours and circumstances that suggest the person might be at risk of being drawn to terrorism. Interviewees explained that at Amnesty, their decisions about who to refer to prevent ultimately rely on the judgment of individuals. In fact, official guidance sanctions the use of gut feeling. And given the high prevalence of negative attitudes towards Muslims in the UK, demonstrated in surveys of the British Muslim of the British public, the breadth of discretion permitted in prevent decision making has resulted in a significant risk of discrimination, which we see borne out in statistics. We also see discrimination in the disproportionate impact on neurodiverse people and children, which is again sanctioned by some of the indicators laid out in the ERG 22 plus. On freedom of expression, thought, conscience and religion, Amnesty International spoke to people who were referred to prevent because of they express non-violent political beliefs, including one person, a trade union representative whose employer referred them to prevent for left-wing social media posts. Prevent practitioners said that their expression of the police should not on its own be sufficient grounds for a referral, but prevent policies and trainings emphasize ideology and political expression, for example, anarchism, anti-fascism, environmentalism. And some supposed indicators of radicalization are associated with nonviolent political beliefs. People who are referred to prevent may be offered mentoring by a state-approved intervention provider whose job it is precisely to challenge their political or religious beliefs. This in and of itself is an interference um, uh, attempt to influence their views and belief and interferes with their rights to expression, freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. On freedom of peaceful assembly, we saw this particularly in universities um, and by local authorities um, who, as a result of prevent, are holding guidance. They must not provide a platform for so-called extremists. But to fulfill this duty, such bodies are now regularly intervening in public events, including on topics resource such as Islamophobia and Palestine, by cancelling room bookings or imposing restrictions on events. These actions unduly stifle the right to freedom of peaceful assembly. Over the years, there's been discussion, there's been quite a lot of talk around prevent having a chilling effect, particularly on the right to freedom of expression, um, and people, for example, people participating in civic or social action. We found this uh, in uh, uh, we found this for now in a survey that we can, we carried out that people said they had modified their behaviour, including refraining from participating in protests or expressing their political or religious views because they feared being flagged and stigmatised by association with prevent. For example, one respondent to the online survey said that after seeing Extinction Rebellion on prevent documents, they chose not to attend any demonstrations organised by them. On Lack of transparency, uh, which uh, 
Sarah spoke about as well, that there's a deeply concerning lack of transparency around prevent. People often don't know why they've been referred or how they can challenge. Uh, we also found a case study of a journalist who had written an article on prevent who was pressured by counter-terrorism police to either reveal that anonymous source or withdraw the article. Uh, not only is that an interference with sort of free press, um, but it also highlights uh, that sort of iron wall built around prevent. So to, to conclude, uh, as many will be aware, Amnesty's mandate is based upon international human rights law, which is what we prevent, assess, which is what we assess prevent on. States have a duty to combat terrorism and are able to restrict rights in order to do so, but the restriction of rights for national security must be provided by law necessary and proportionate to meet that aim. Um, there's lots of evidence uh, that there's very little evidence uh, around the effectiveness um, of PREVENT in meeting its intended aim, but there's lots of evidence that the PREVENT strategy disproportionately restricts human rights. So we, yeah, which is uh, why we reached the conclusion we did once we passed PREVENT through uh, the test set out in international human rights law. Um, we also, and I will just end by saying this, uh, as you know, on this call, there's a number of speakers from various organizations. Um, we're particularly acutely aware that in the past, when concerns have been raised about prevent um, and the operation of activities in the pre criminal space, organizations, individual actors within those organizations or community groups that work around these issues are quite often demeaned, delegitimized, or smeared. Um, and we know that there's a particular responsibility which is often not met by government and others to not to, 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 to end this practice effectively. And one of the one of our calls is ending the practice of delegitimizing civil society organizations, journalists, academics, amongst others, who have raised concerns about the operation of prevent and counterterrorism and counter extremism, and instead meaningfully engage with the criticisms and issues raised. Um, and this is particularly uh, to the fore at the moment, given the expansion of the definition of extremism by Michael Gove and the introduction of a blacklist. Um, it's really important that all of us work together to combat these uh, sort of further encroachments uh, on our rights um, and stand in, stand in solidarity with each other as we resist these encroachment and restrictions on our rights uh, and we challenge policies that to prevent uh, Alan Le and and back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Ilias. I think you raise really important issues and um, particularly with Amnesty's report. I think this is something we can make sure that we share after the call as well. Um, so now to introduce our second speaker, we have Dr. Leila Atulhaj, who is the Director and Senior Caseworker at Prevent Watch. Um, Prevent Watch is an NGO that supports individuals who have been impacted by the Prevent Duty Leila has been directly involved with 300 of the 700 cases that have been documented by Prevent Watch to date. She co-authored the People's Review of Prevent, the People's Review of Prevent, and the Response to Shawcross report with Professor with Professor John Holmwood, and has contributed to a number of articles, UN submissions, and reports as an expert in Prevent. Thank you so much for joining us, Leila, and I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks um, to everyone who's attending and to Open Rights Group for producing the report and organising um, this event today. I'm just going to share my screen because I have some slides that hopefully keep me on track. Um, let me just remember how I want to do this. I want to do it as a presenter view. I just have to get so sure. Um, I assume everyone can see my slides. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes just going through um, some elements of uh, prevent data and uh, try to link it in to some of the things that Open Rights Group found in their most recent report. And I've titled this particular presentation, Illusory Truths, mainly because I'm trying to get this phrase to stick. Um, and I genuinely believe that it is at the heart 
of a lot of the issues that we see around prevent data. So I'm going to go through about three things that we're constantly told. Uh, many of you may be aware that, you know, if false information is repeated time and time again, it tends to be believed as truth. And so I'm going to go through about three of these particular points which relate to data and prevent specifically. Um, I'm going to keep them very case focused because as Prevent Watch, um, we have the largest resource of prevent cases and this is our sole remit. We only deal with prevent. Um, we offer a free helpline and through that free helpline, we have uh, supported more than 700 individuals and their families. Um, and that support ranges from you know, giving initial information and guidance in terms of what they can do at various parts of the pipeline, depending on, you know, if they've just been referred to prevent, if they're about to be referred to prevent, or indeed if they're being pressured to take part in channel. Um, some issues around these prevent referrals are litigated. Some people are introduced to friendly journalists so that they can expose their story and what happened to them without uh, being completely uh, thrown under the bus by a journalist who has a specific agenda in mind. Um, and most of the reports and research that have come out around Prevent, if they are discussing case studies, um, we've tended to, to feed into either through expertise or mainly through um, that primary evidence of, of case, cases. So I'll cover three illusory truths that I, I refer to. The first is that there's six to 7,000 Prevent referrals per year. The second is that prevent referral information is shared for support or safeguarding purposes. And the third is that um, more information can't be shared and this whole opaque uh, nature of prevent and data is actually due to national security concerns. And I'll unpick each of those. So the first, that's six to 7,000 prevent referrals each year. If you look at the home office statistics published annually, that's around the number you'll see. I believe last year's was 6,817 prevent referrals that the home office suggests uh, came through. Now, if we consider how many public sector workers, and not only public sector workers, but even private sector workers now, are trained up on prevent and the process of a prevent referral, you know, everyone is basically trained up to spot these signs of radicalization. You have the entire UK population at your disposal and you're supposed to uh, identify signs that people may be vulnerable to radicalisation. Um, and when this occurs, whether it's in a school setting or in a healthcare setting or anywhere else, then the person, the teacher, the doctor will fill out a prevent referral form. Um, that referral form will be vetted in the first instance by counterterrorism officers. Um, and then if they deem it a, a genuine referral, then they will send it on to be considered um, at channel panel, at the multi-agency channel panel meetings. Now, traditionally, or historically, should I say, 5% of the six to 7,000 referrals every year made it to be discussed at channel panel. It didn't mean they were deemed suitable to go into channel, but they were discussed. And in the last year or two, that number has gone up to about 16% um, who are then discussed at channel panel. Um, in some ways suggesting that maybe the vetting process is becoming better or the referrals coming through are better because actually now you're not you don't have this like 95 percent false referral uh, rate even though those people who are referred into channel also still haven't actually done anything wrong um and we suggest that these numbers are really conservative because we have had several cases um whereby we know that prevent referral has been made but it does not appear on the prevent case management database, which is an issue because where are these unofficial prevent referrals? Um, so one example is a four-year-old Muslim boy who was referred to prevent for talking about the online game Fortnite. And we saw this prevent referral form. We know for all intents and purposes, this was a prevent referral. All the paperwork had been filed. Um, it was made by the school, it was processed by the police. And yet when this story came out, and a very embarrassing story, because nobody wants to think that actually are, you know, the most important arm of the counterterrorism strategy, as it is referred to by opponents of Prevent, um, is referring four-year-olds for talking about online games. When this story came out in The Guardian, uh, and it was picked up by many media outlets, the then national coordinator of Prevent, Nick Adams, tweeted that he had looked for this case, and actually it's not on the Prevent uh, database. Okay, so he admitted this is not on the prevent database, which reinforced what we had seen and what we had suspected from other cases as well, where we couldn't find the information. Um, and obviously, we had some doubt. We thought, well, maybe we just can't find the information due to like national security exemptions. But there definitely seems to be 
a pot, and we don't know how big this pot is, of unofficial prevent referrals. Um, and there is a data trail because the schools made the referral and therefore it's saved on the school safeguarding file that this child has had a prevent refer related concern. The police have picked up this referral. And in fact, this, this child's family were visited at 10.30 in the night by police officers. So there is information there and there is certainly data there, but it's not something that if you um, ask for the numbers for prevent referrals will actually come up. Um, and so it's very problematic. And I think the implications of one of um, ORG's uh, conclusions, uh, sorry, recommendations, um, is that it's difficult for people to exercise their right to erasure and, rest, uh, and request for data to be removed. And I think if we think about it in the context that actually there are so many more people who don't know if they've ever been referred to prevent, or maybe do know that they've been referred to prevent, but can't actually prove it, then the implications of this particular recommendation are even greater than, um, you know, than what we originally envisioned if we thought that this, these numbers were, were legitimate and it was only six to 7,000 every year. So the second um, illusory truth is that prevent referral information is shared for support or safeguarding purposes. Now, most of those referrals, as I mentioned, uh, historically, it's always been like 95%, actually have no further action, okay? Um, at least not for the purposes of what could be deemed um, for channel or suitable for, for channel. Um, and so those 95% are still recorded, the data is still retained, the ORG report shows this. Um, and the excuse for this is that it's actually retained or shared with other agencies for safeguarding or for support purposes. And I want to debunk that because there are two cases that are mentioned in the ORG report. One is in box four and one is in box five. The first one is the case of Tarek. Um, he is a 16 year old student. He went to a sixth form college and um, when he enrolled, so I'm just making sure I know which one is which because I know we've anonymized these names. <laughs> uh, yeah, so when he enrolled in this prestigious college, um, he was given he was given the place. Now, previously, he had a prevent referral from secondary school and the secondary school, because they write down the prevent referrals in the safeguarding file, share the safeguarding file once you accept a place in another school or university, that safeguarding file will follow the student. And this is exactly what happened with Tarek when he went to the sixth form. He went in in September expecting that he was having this like induction interview and instead he was grilled on his previous prevent referral. And in September, he was left without a place. So can you imagine you're about to start your A-levels, you think that you're starting in September, it's already September, and now you've just been told that actually, you're not gonna be, you're, you're not allowed to continue on because your values um, don't align, your values and your behavior don't align with what this sixth form college expects. And there's another similar case um, where the sixth form student has started, he was pulled up for a breach of uniform policy and then told that actually he doesn't meet the values of the school and was sent home and he lost out about two, two weeks of schooling as a result of what was basically like an informal suspension. Um, no paperwork was given to suggest that actually they're going to try and exclude him, um, but his prevent referral was mentioned and this followed him as it did the other uh, student into his six form, this wasn't a supportive, you know, it wasn't a supportive function. It didn't serve as a safeguarding function for anyone, especially not the person who was referred. And so I think this idea that somehow, um, you know, these referrals are uh, shared because it's gonna be supportive of a student rather than hinder their progress or impact their, their future is completely inaccurate. Um, I also know of a university student who recently realized a few years after um, the fact that when he was suspended from university, he was actually excluded from his university position, kicked out. He also lost the housing because he was living on campus as part of, of student accommodation. Um, that actually it was due to the fact that police had shared his previous prevent referral with the university uh, midway through his course. Um, he did not obviously finish his degree. He left, he didn't even realize that this had happened until years after the event. Then he realized and backtracked um, and realized that actually this was due to prevent information sharing from the police to the university. Um, when this was revealed that there was data sharing between colleges, um, I remember there was a FOI that was published and Guardian ran with the story um, and Dr. Hilary uh, Akade was, was, was quoted, I think, several times in this particular uh, 
article because it was um, them who put forward this information. There were a few uh, points where um, the university suggested that the data sharing was so that they could receive support services. And a government spokesperson specifically said that being referred under channel panel will have no, uh, under channel program will have no bearing on a person's education or career prospects. Okay? These individuals weren't even referred to channel, the examples that I just gave you in the previous slide. They weren't even referred to channel. They were only referred to prevent. They didn't even progress onto channel and yet it impacted their education and their career prospects as a result. So again, we don't believe this uh, second point, which is that the information is only shared for those particular purposes. And the third illusory truth is that, you know, information somehow has to be withheld because of national security concerns. And I know that this is an issue that many organizations have faced. Um, to be honest, I just put this slide together in the last moments thinking of some of the FOIs that I know have been refused in the last few months. Um, but this could be like 20 slides of logos because I know that there are many organizations that have faced issues when it comes to putting in FOIs to our own clients who have put in subject access requests for their own information. And we've noticed a trend where previously people were getting their subject access requests. Now they're getting subject access requests that are heavily even more redacted than before in ways that weren't necessarily used as an excuse previously. Um, we have complaints, for example, who have come in about particular clients and that complaint has provoked a prevent referral and yet they're not being given access to the concern mentioned in the complaint. Previously, they would have just blanked out the person who made the, uh, the complaint and they'll leave like the main body of text in terms of the actual concern, but now they're removing the concern as well in the subject access request. I know that Rights and Security International have been asking for um, FOIs around the segregation of data so that they can see ethnicity and gender and age in a more appropriate way because Home Office definitely don't segregate this data in a way that we can really scrutinize it properly. For example, they show 15 year olds in a range with 15 to 20. I mean, you can't even tell how many children are referred every year to prevent because they're not cutting it off at 18 years old. And this idea of 15 to 20 is completely arbitrary. It's, it doesn't even follow any real sense in terms of where people are in their life. Um, and I know that justice.org uh, also, you know, put in FOIs for segregation of data. They didn't get it. I think Rights and Security International did get it, but what they received, they were told was incomplete. And I think they had some restrictions in terms of what they could actually report on. We've put in a number of FOIs as part of the People's Review of Prevent. We had to put in hundreds of FOIs just to try and get some information around Prevent. I know that Open Rights Group in this particular report um, had two dedicated interns who like have a track record of being experts in putting in FOIs just to be able to get some of this information. Um, so it is a real hurdle. And this idea that somehow that information isn't available to us because of national security concerns, I just want to show this particular slide that I usually use in my introductions for Prevent, which is just a reminder that Prevent is in the pre-criminal space. To suggest that someone who hasn't done anything wrong, who hasn't planned anything, who has no intention of doing anything, and who even when they're visited by prevent officers, the prevent officers admit that they are under no suspicion of anything, cannot have their information because of national security concerns, makes no sense whatsoever. And yet time and again, this is upheld. This idea that national security exemptions are, are the reason is upheld. So um, just some concluding points. I don't mean for the future of prevent data to sound so grim, but the concerns around data um, with prevent remain unaddressed. Um, Shawcross did mention in one of his uh, recommendations that the uh, retention of data be reduced from six years to an arbitrary three years um, when it comes to police and for them to consider it. They have considered it and they have suggested that they are not going to uh, make any changes to how data is stored currently uh, with regards to no further action cases being stored for at least six years. Um, it's likely to be hard, even harder now to expose data concerns and breaches going forward, given um, the uh, changes in other related bills like the uh, uh, what's it called? data protection and digital information bills and other bills that are being put in, in place that are going to have little bits of legislation that are going to make it much more harder and just create extra hurdles for us to get our own information. Um, however, I do think that 
the inconsistencies that have been exposed and more inconsistencies will be exposed because that's the nature of lies is that, you know, the more you lie, the more you get tangled up in that web. And I think there have been enough lies about prevent that they are being exposed more and more and it will help us to um, expose and dismantle prevent and finally scrap it. Um, I do think the new uh, the need to challenge the new definition of extremism um, because of these concerns, which uh, Elias mentioned just before me, of people being delegitimized, of organizations being de delegitimized, is really important because ultimately the same people who are trying to um, expose and show exactly how prevent works are going to be the same people in the same organizations um, that are shut down, that are suffocated, essentially, especially mainstream organizations that receive major grants. You know, all of that is going to take place. We ourselves as Prevent Watch recently received a grant from JRCT. And before the money had even hit the bank, um, the Telegraph were trying to um, you know, make a non-story out of it, essentially, that, oh, you know, JRCT have given funding. And this new definition of extremism is exactly that. It's the attempt on the ground, the real um, impact on the ground is going to be to try and stop not the smaller organisations that are doing the work, but the bigger grant-making organisations try and put pressure on them to stop funding um, um, other people who are involved in raising concerns about prevent. And so there, there are going to be definitely obstacles ahead that we need to um, tackle beforehand. Thanks. Stop there. Thanks so much, Leila. I feel like um, what you were saying paints a really clear picture of the landscape um, which, you know, prevent is existing in and like evolving concerns related to it as well. Um, so we're now moving on to our third speaker, who is Charlotte Heath-Kelly, who is a professor of politics and international studies at the University of Warwick. She is currently leading a five-year study funded by the European Commission of Preventing Violent Extremism Programs Across Europe. Her most recent work has been published in the journals Parliamentary Affairs and Theoretical Criminolog Criminology, and the book Vulnerability, Securing the Social Through Security Polit Politics came out with Manchester University Press in 2023. Thanks so much, Charlotte, and over to you. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for organising. And yeah, sorry about all the semicolons in book titles and such like, you know, it's a, it's an academic habit. We can't go without a semicolon, so apologies for that. Um, it's great to be here today and uh, to speak about the ORG report. Um, and I'm just going to sort of um, complete the round of speakers by focusing on something really particular about what I think the major contribution of this report is. Um, and the, what I think that is, is that by focusing on data and the processing of data, this report has uh, brought together several sort of FOIs and pieces of information and brought them together in a way that we've learned something new about Prevent through this work. And fundamentally, that is, it doesn't make any sense to speak about Prevent in the singular. There are at least three and I'm going to sort of take you through this with a slide in a second um, as to why it would make a lot more sense for our understanding if we thought of it as three separate spaces of work. So uh, all of this occurs in the legal framework through the Counterterrorism and Security Act, also the Data Protection Act um, and the Police Crime and Disorder Act. So these three laws come together in a way that makes it a lot more understandable to see three different prevents rather than one. So let me try and find, I have not used Zoom for a while. Could I please have screen sharing enabled because it's still blocked for me. Sorry, I'll do that now. Do you have that now? Oh yeah, here we go. Right, let me find the right slide. I'm just gonna, try playing around with it, see if I can get it on the right one for you. Okay, bear with me. I just need to move something out of the way. There we go. So I want to focus on a particular slide. Can you see the slide that's got a picture of pathway on it? Okay, good. So with my little arrow, the prevent you probably know about attendees is up here in the top multi-agency channel management process. That's the prevent you likely know about. It's the one where after a section 36 decision, your referral goes to your local authority and your local authority sit there and discuss you basically without your consent. Yay, wonderful. Now that is 
one prevent so that is the prevent we know about it's the prevent that's mostly spoken about it's the one owned by your local authority and the reason i'm highlighting this is that that means the other two prevents that we're going to speak about are not owned in the open sphere by your local authority instead the other parts of prevent are owned by something called counterterrorism policing this is very much the covert national security space so counterterrorism policing are not your local police force. They are very close to intelligence agencies, but they are not by definition an intelligence agency. I'm bringing my own sort of um, term in here that I'm trying to make real, which is intelligence agency adjacent. So if you want to understand counterterrorism policing, they sit not locally with your local police force. They're a national body. Uh, split into regional bits. They sit next to MI5 and MI6, um, GCHQ, and they receive intel from those intelligence agencies. So this is the national security state, um, and they are in the Data Protection Act, what's known as a competent authority. So they have basically a certificate that means they don't have to obey the normal um, procedures, the Data Protection Act. They are a specified competent authority to do covert work. So this means that we need to really separate our understanding of prevent according to who is holding the data at which stage and what legislation applies to them. Because as a covert police force, counterterrorism policing does not have the same uh, processing restrictions as your local authority. It's completely different. So if I get my little arrow back, if we come over here to the left hand side where prevent referral is made. This is where you enter the process. Um, your journey begins here. Now, the second a prevent referral is made, it doesn't go into the open space of a local authority. It goes straight into the covert space of national security. So the second your school, your university, your NHS trust makes that referral, it goes straight onto prevent case management tracker. It's in the hands of counterterrorism policing, first of all. This is the covert space. This is the space where you have no rights necessarily to um, to remove that information or even to know that it's there. They're allowed to lie to you and say, neither confirm nor deny. The first thing that CTP, counterterrorism policing, do is that they work with a fixed intelligence management unit to make sure this person being referred is not currently being investigated under pursue. Um, so they check their covert databases immediately. Your name is now associated on there. Um, to make sure that, you know, they don't need to escalate this to pursue. So that's the first check they do. And the second check is called the prevent gateway assessment, where they gather information about you to see what they want to do. Basically, how serious a case are you? All of this occurs in the national security space. It is covert. You don't necessarily have a right to know that it's happening or to ever get that data out of there because this is a competent authority in the terms of the Data Protection Act. So you're, you're in the secure world here. At that point, the counterterrorism officer is going to make a decision about you. If they decide that possibly you might have some kind of ideological influence going on there that they're not keen on, but you're in no way a threat to the state, they're going to make a Section 36 decision. And at that point, you move from here up here to the multi-agency process. You leave the covert realm uh, and you enter the local authority realm. At this point, you're out of the, the ground, back out in the open again. Your data is stored on a different system from this point onwards, the channel management information system. This is your local authority. So that's your sort of way out of the covert realm. Your data is still there in the covert spaces as well. It's just that it's now in the open space as well. What other decisions can be made at this point? Well, so we're talking about sort of prevent one, where you're in the covert realm of the first three checks. Prevent two, when you leave and go into the local authority space and you're in the open realm now, and you at some point might even be asked your consent for discussions to occur about you, maybe. Prevent three is one of the major contributions of the ORG report. And that's down here, police-led partnership. So we're starting to find out now from various FOIs and bits of government publication that there is a third prevent. If during your assessment by the counterterrorism officer, they don't 
think that you're, you know, that you need to go to pursue because you're actively planning, you know, that's over there. Let's park that. They could decide to send you to the local authority if they think you're benign, but maybe vulnerable. Or there's like this other pathway called police led partnership. And that is we think you are too dodgy to be managed by your local authority. And I've seen the FOI requests that ORG got. And as an individual, I'm allowed to speak a bit more freely about them because I don't represent anybody. Um, they're really interesting. So there's a particular FOI that we both saw where they forgot to redact it properly. Um, it's now no longer available. But if you want a copy, drop me an email. I'm easily findable on, you know, on Google. Drop me an email. I have the unredacted version. And the unredacted version is what um, what does the counterterrorism officer need to see in your gateway assessment to send you into continued covert management in secret prevent the police led partnership? And effectively, it is you refuse your consent to go through channel. So you may say, my political activism is none of your business. No, I don't want an ideological mentor. At that point, if you refuse consent for channel and open prevent, you will be put on closed prevent in the police led partnership space. So basically everybody continues to discuss you without your consent. Your case is managed by the national security uh, realm, counterterrorism policing, and they can take additional measures against you if you're leafleting people or being disruptive. So this includes prosecuting you for non-terrorism offences. Um, it can go all the way to wards of court to start saying that you're not safe to look after your kids. So it's a really serious space where they can use um, anti-disruption measures on you, um, as well as just monitoring all of your data. So this is the third prevent, which is completely covert, but involves your health uh, provider, your education provider, et cetera. And this is likely prevent one here in the early stage and prevent three here, police-led partnership stage. This is where your data is largely unreachable by you because this is a, a competent authority under law that can refuse you access to your data uh, and refuse any sort of proportionality um, standards that you might otherwise apply. Uh, it's not a blanket exception. It can be challenged. It's just that it's um, it's more prone to being recognized as a police force that doesn't need to tell you that they're acting upon your data and processing your data because they're a competent authority in the terms of the law. This is really worrying, right? It may, In one way, it's exciting because it makes a lot of sense as to some of the reasons we sometimes can't find things. We don't understand why someone's prevent referral is suddenly with border security. Like, how did that happen? Now that we know that there's three different stages of prevent with different laws that apply to them, we can make a lot more sense of those questions as to how this is happening. It's also fundamentally frightening um, for, for living in a supposed, you know, liberal democracy, that there are secret policing programs that are operating upon you when you are not plotting an attack, when you are not conspiring, when you are not doing anything that reaches the threshold of investigation. So this is a, um, a very intense pre-crime space here. Um, the final thing I'll say is, the, the note I've got written beside me is, safeguarding in capital letters, question mark, exclamation mark. So we're told that the justification for pre-crime management of citizens is that um, it's for their own good. It's to safeguard them, meet their needs. I mean, finding out that there's three different spaces of prevent kind of fundamentally explodes that as assumption. You know, this is this is covert management by a national security operating force. Um, there's no way that this is in any definition of safeguarding, something that's done for your own protection. This is uh, quite extreme pre-crime policing. So that's my kind of end of my thoughts, that there's three prevents, not one. And I will stop sharing my screen um, as soon as I work out how to do that. That was not the right button. Hmm. Ah, there it is. There we are. Thanks so much, Charlotte. That was great. Um, yeah, that was really helpful. And I think, 
you know, I've also written down safeguarding as a note to myself. I think one of the most insidious things about Prevent is that it's presented as a safeguarding tool and yet actually is being used for mass surveillance. Um, so now we're gonna be moving on to questions. Um, our first question that we have is, it says, the government has updated the definition of extremism. What do you think the impact of this will be? As it's non-statutory guidance, do we even know if this is replacing the definition of prevent that is currently used? Um, Ilias, I wonder if you'd like to start off speaking to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's, it's worth flagging that um, the amnesty research relied upon the former definition of extremism, which is operationalized through prevent. And um, what we found is that definition of extreme of extremism is so expansive in criminalizing legitimate nonviolent political activism, including trade union organizing, environmental organizing, organizing on university campuses around Palestine, Islamophobia, etc. And the new definition is <laughs> even more expansive than that. Uh, so it's perfect. Is it's more likely to capture again that legitimate uh, activism and and criminalize it, which um, we'll see uh, operationalized through prevent as well. Uh, it is non-statutory guidance, and there's a very important reason why it's non-statutory guidance because it can't be made statutory because it's so broad. Um, you know, one of the things that the uh, the one one of the things that's in the definition of extremism is like the institutions of democracy and parliament, etc. Right? That includes, for example, the unelected House of Lords. Uh, there was concerns that if they made this expanded definition of extremism statutory, it would encapsulate the Scottish National Party. Uh, I think now it's currently the third largest political party in the House of Commons, um, because they believe in the abolishment of the house, the unelected chamber of the House of Lords. Right? And um, so. That's why these things are non-statutory because um, <laughs> because they're too broad. Uh, so we'd be referring uh, even our own legislators um, through panel, right? Uh, so yes, the the new definition of extremism will be operationalized through policies like prevent, um, and we should all be really alert and concerned about that. Uh, um, there were, I think, close to 60 organisations I wrote to the Prime Minister uh, the week after the uh, the week of the definition's launch, um, calling on the Prime Minister to take a different approach and scrap that expansion. Uh, many, many of us are repeating those calls still. Thank you, Ilias. And I'm reminded of what you were saying initially when you first spoke about how solidarity is so important at this point in time. Um, we have another question, which is for Layla, kind of related to the last one. And it says, the Guardian recently revealed that a prevent document had included believing in anti-fascism, socialism, or being anti-abortion with, ex with signs of extremism. What are the most egregious cases you have heard about? Oh, gosh, it's hard to pick. <laughs> um, I think... <laughs> I think the ones where it's they're really young children are the worst ones. So, you know, when you have four year olds and five year olds being referred, um, we had a five year old who basically had um, prevent officers go to the to to the school. And the reason they went is because the dad didn't want to engage with them. So this is like where they can now use their disruptive tactics, I think, and drawing on uh, what Charlotte was saying, you know, oh, you don't want to deal with me. You've not given consent but now we're going to go via your children. Um, and that's exactly what they did, which is really, I mean, I don't even know how to describe that other than really disgusting when you think that that is something that they can do and have done. Um, so they went to this five-year-old school and they asked the teachers if there were any concerns that had been raised about this child. Um, the teachers initially said no. And then obviously, because two counterterrorism officers have turned up there, they're wrecking their brain thinking, what could possibly be happening? Have we missed something? Um, and then an email was sent to the counterterrorism officers the next day um, titled, you know, of potential concern, uh, saying that this five-year-old five -year had basically said that Allah makes everything, Allah creates everything, including snow, um, and also that he had learned an Arabic prayer. And it was that, that was the potential concern. 
Um, and I think, yeah, just things like that, because the child is so young, because of the way in which that concern was raised, um, I think is is really horrible. I know we had an adult as well who was um who was visited and he was basically told on the political spectrum where do you sit can, and they drew a line the police the prevent officer drew a line and said can you mark on this line where you think you sit on the political spectrum this is this was part of the vetting process that this prevent officer was doing to see if this was a genuine referral or not and I believe that the concern was a far-right concern and that's why they wanted them to draw I mean I don't know how accurate you can be with that, but yeah, there are so many, unfortunately, but I think that gives a bit of a flavor. <laughs> so incredibly shocking. And I wonder how many people know that this is the truth of like how it is being operationalized. Um, so we have another question here, which says at the Migrants Rights Network, we noted in the Shawcross review that there was a recommendation to expand prevent duties to immigration authorities. We are concerned how this might impact migrants, including refugees and their immigration or asylum applications. Do you have any more information on whether or how this is progressing or could be embedded? Um, is there anyone who'd like to pick up that one in particular? Um, so we have raised this. Oh, sorry, Lola, go for it. You and me. I, I thought Charlotte was going to say something, but go for it. So. Um, so I think we we have raised this to try and find out what's going on because an expansion of the current scheduled authority should require a statutory instrument, but we're just waiting to see what, uh, how the government will take this forward. Um, we don't believe there's grounds of the current legislation for the expansion uh, of scheduled authority without it going through parliament, um, but there may be some that believe that is the case. So, uh, yeah, maybe we should catch the practices and we can try and follow up on that. Did you want to come in on that as well, Charlotte or Leila? Uh, yeah, I was kind of thinking that that's the most dangerous potential, you know, route that could possibly happen in the, you know, the most precariously situated people are going to be exposed to not just the multi-agency prevent, but some of the secret prevent that, that you know, we identified in the report. Um, that could be, yeah, extremely damaging, especially with the new laws that have gone, you know, gone through. In the in the work of sort of counter-terrorism policing, they have their own kind of risk assessment documents and uh, asylum seeking children and people with military experience are, are very highly profiled in their internal risk assessments so this couldn't be more dangerous linking up the prevent duty uh with immigration and, and board force it couldn't be more dangerous there's another secret program that operates um let's say at prevent one and prevent three the bits held by the national security state not the local authority so this is the bits that would primarily um affect somebody um in the care of sort of care, border control there's additional secret programs that operate at the intersections of those uh, bits of pathway in the graph as well. So I'd, I'd sort of add in my two cents to say that community should be very, very aware of any referrals to mental health. Because if you're on the sort of high risk scale in counterterrorism policing terms, that you're claiming asylum, that you've come from an area where you may have seen violence, you may be traumatized, they're going to refer you to mental health practitioners, but they're also going to have a secret relationship with them where they obtain your records and they maintain a, a surveillance one step removed um, of anybody in that situation through their medical records and through their compliance with medication. So there is a, another program nationally that's just um, just been funded to the tune of 17 million by the government to do this. And this is a changes its name frequently. It's now called Counterterrorism Clinical Consultancy Service. There we go. That is the third name it's had in the space of a year, but um, that will be operating in that space. So I thought I should sort of warn everybody that that is additionally there and that is not care, that is, that is surveillance. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, we have another question which touches on 
the responsibilities of those who hold the prevent duty. Um, it is, do you think that people who are making prevent referrals are aware that data is being retained for so long, even if a case requires no further action? Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely not. I mean, most people who make prevent referrals, in fact, everyone who makes a prevent referral, they never get feedback in terms of where that prevent referral has ended up. Um, you know, even teachers who are making referrals about their students are not then being informed where that prevent referral has ended up, whether further action was taken, whether social services were involved, because for every child referral, social services assessment will also occur. I mean, it's voluntary most in most cases, but the fact that social services also receive a referral for every child referral, you know, you would think that the teacher putting in the referral would then know that and they don't and I've spoken to many educators who are really shocked when I tell them about the impact of prevent and say to them actually do you know that once you hit that button once you send that referral in this is what happens downstream um, and we saw it with uh, one of our younger cases as well where they put in a prevent referral I think it was the fortnight case actually um, where they said you know they were really shocked that officers had attended the house they were really shocked at the process that led after them putting in that prevent referral for that child talking about the Fortnite game. Um, and they themselves then put in, you know, a complaint. I had another school uh, off the back of October 7th when a referral was put in because an eight year old autistic boy shouted out yay when he was watching a news clip round that was showed to him by the teacher. They put in a prevent referral, realised it was disproportionate once they had put it in and once complaints came in by the parents. But then even when they realized what had happened, they then put in a complaint to the local authority um, about the way in which that prevent referral was unfolding. So I, I don't think anyone appreciates and they definitely not kept in the loop in terms of what happens next. And uh, Leila will know that I always sort of jump on at this point to say, if we leave you as an audience with one thought, it is that the second a prevent referral goes in, it goes to the national security state first. So we all assume that it stays in the open realm and that it will go from a school to your local authority and it doesn't, it only, not all of them will get to the local authority, right? But if it does, that's stage four in the process and that it sits on very secure, well, national security covert police databases until it gets there. Even if it does get back to the local authority, it is still in the national security covert databases there. Um, and it's very difficult to get out. So, yeah, we we want to leave people with the thought of if you're going to make a referral, you need to be absolutely confident that that person deserves the attention of counterterrorism policing and the national security state. Like if you're that and if you're that sure, you should probably be calling the police directly rather than making a prevent referral. <laughs> like if you're that sure that that person needs spooks to investigate you know, their covert communications, just ring 999, don't make a prevent referral. That would, yeah. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, we have a, another question here, which is there any potential to launch awareness among the public services about the consequences of their referral? So I guess this is speaking to action or like steps moving forward. We have been trying to, um, it's a slow process, but this is again where that solidarity and that networking really helps. Um, I think we've started with like the education unions just because the majority of, like, well, the highest proportion of referrals, it stood at 39% last year, um, comes from within the education sector. Um, so anyone who can put on an event, anyone who has networks to the various bodies who tend to be responsible for, um, implementing prevent and actually making those prevent referrals like we'd be happy to speak to them I know Amnesty would be happy to speak to them ORG like there are many organizations here um, as well as not even on this call who would be happy to go and give briefings and raise that awareness we have started um, this attempt and we recognized it as one of our target targets for the people's review of prevent was you know forget speaking to government because they're not listening um we don't need to convince communities impacted by prevent that they're impacted by prevent and actually who we really need to be speaking to are the people who are implementing prevent the people who have that duty so we've we've started and uh, i know there's going to be a lot more work done on that not only by ourselves but also i think amnesty as well um going forward as part of a, a, a longer term strategy 
Yeah. And we've uh, we've made a film with Prevent Watch of four referrals telling, you know, people and families telling their own stories. So if if anyone here needs to sort of have a conversation with educators, with healthcare workers, sometimes film is a good medium, right? So people telling their own stories of what happens to them. So we've got that film, Prevent Watch made it available. I've got a, a copy on a website if you need it. So that's that's part of the sort of awareness raising uh, as well that's going on. Thanks, Charlotte. Elias, did you want to come in? Uh, yeah, just very briefly, um, we are looking to launch an online course which acts as a sort of alternative to prevent training, which discusses the harms uh, and human rights violations of prevent uh, in its operation, uh, which we're hoping to launch in the next few months. So when we do, we'll be sure to send it across to ORG um, to send on to uh, uh, yeah, so definitely subscribe to the phenomenal work they're doing and hopefully you'll get a link to that. Thanks so much. Um, and maybe this is a good question for us to finish on. So it says prevent is obviously very flawed and ineffective. Do the panel have any thoughts on alternative ways of challenging extremism, especially given the rise in anti-Semitic and Islamophobic attacks in the UK in the last few months? I think this is a question that is often asked um, and, you know, the, the, the question is always like, what is the alternative, which I think we need to reframe. Um, firstly, you know, prevent doesn't actually work. It doesn't do what it says on the tin. Um, we've never been able to predict a future crime, let alone a terror offence. And I don't think we should start pretending that we have the tools or the ability to do so when it comes to terror offences today. Um, we're not in some privileged position where we can predict the future. Um, the, the examples used are actually really good examples because these tend to be the examples whether it's, you know, anti-Semitic attacks, Islamophobic attacks, um, you know, we're trying to reduce homophobic attacks, racist attacks, terror attacks. And these are all these all come under the banner of why people will be referred to prevent, right? It doesn't even necessarily have to be linked to terrorism. We've had people who, who have made alleged homophobic statements who have been referred to prevent. Um, and I think all of those things are crimes. They all have a toolkit of how to deal with it if it reaches a criminal criminal threshold. And if it doesn't reach the criminal threshold, if it is a child having an unpalatable view who's articulating themselves saying, you know, I really think this and I don't like that, then have those teachable moments in schools like people used to have prior to prevent. Um, you know, most of the people who have come out and raised criticisms about prevent when it comes to the education sector are people who are older and who understand what safeguarding, traditional safeguarding looked like before prevent was invented, like before its inception. Now, most of the people within education um, are a lot younger and don't know a world prior to prevent, which I think is really scary. Um, but yeah, I think given given the rise in any attacks, we can't refer back to something that we know does not work. Um, and especially when we're talking about extremism, I mean, what is extremism? How do we challenge extremism? Do we even want to challenge extremism? Because extremism in, is so subjective. And you know, if somebody's extreme, it doesn't mean they're dangerous. It just means that their view is outside of the main window, you know? And all radical change and all really brilliant movements have been as a result of what have been considered extreme thoughts or extreme actions. So I think we need to be really, really careful about accepting and normalizing this idea that extremism is a problem, it's a dirty word. Yeah, I completely agree. I think this is really key, particularly where the government has set out to expand the definition of extremism. And the question for me is who gets to define extremism and what does that tell us about, you know, what we're actually trying to say when we use that word? Um, I wonder, Ilias, uh, Charlotte, Leila, any final remarks just before we close off? I was typing an answer to one of the other questions in the chat, so I hope that came through. Um, basically, the question was, are there other nations that implement preventing violent extremism? And the answer is yes, the UK wasn't even the first. Um, actually, the birth of preventing violent extremism was Russia pre-9-11. So we're all told that this is a post 9-11 policy. 
Russia, with its lovely record on civil liberties, was doing this to its minorities uh, before 9-11. Um, but 9-11 was the watershed moment that sort of allowed European nations, at least, to start considering repressive and authoritarian sort of surveillance techniques. So there's a long history to this um, that is never told, but it's um, it's an interesting one. So watch this space. Eventually, we're going to write a book on it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to all of our speakers and to everyone who's joined us today. It's been a really informative conversation. I've definitely learned a lot and we'll um, follow up by email with um, the different reports and other resources that might be helpful to those of you that are here. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye.